our prime thing is shellfish water classification. So we administer the National Shellfish Sanitation Program, which classifies shellfish waters on where it's safe to harvest shellfish from. Uh, but we also oversee the Recreational Bathing Beach Program, and we do a lot of other testing. We have three laboratories, microbiology, we have advanced microbiology, and we also have a chemistry laboratory where we do um, ambient nutrients, um, and also Barney Bay intensive projects that we've worked on. We do phytoplankton monitoring, so it's a broad array of what we do, slocum gliders, real-time continuous monitoring, and we've done a lot of non-point source tracking projects over the years. Um, the main thing that we do though is classification program. We update the growing orders on an annual basis and it's based on the most basically recent three years of data that we have. Could be a little longer based on um, shellfish sanitation program guidelines. We collect overall throughout the whole state over 12,000 fecal coliform samples a year. So we're covering all the waters from Delaware Bay up to Artificial Island, all the way up into Raritan Sandy Hook Bay, the Atlantic Ocean, and all the coastal bays and rivers. Um, and we analyze that is based on fecal coliform levels for the classification. Um, in the Navasink River itself, we sample 40, we have 48 sampling stations that we collect about 10 times per year. Um, Shrewsbury, we have 46 collected 10 times per year. So out of that 12,000, a big chunk is out of the Navasink and Shrewsbury. I mean, we're close to 1,000 samples within Chester's area. Um, and the classifications that we have, we have approved shellfish water classification, conditionally approved, which are open in certain seasons, and we also have the restricted and prohibited. Restricted classifications are classifications where the shellfish harvested from those waters have to go to a depuration plant, which there's two of them up in the in the Bay Area, um, and then or they can be relayed to approved waters. There's no active relay program currently in New Jersey. Um, overall, 78% of our waters throughout the state are classified as year-round approved, which is is pretty good overall on percentage and, and acres. But we do have problem areas. Um, so why are we here? As, as Cindy pointed out earlier, we saw the same thing. We do not like to see when large areas get downgraded. Um, we, we did a big downgrade in Navasink, and it's, it's a big chunk of the upper part of the Navasink River, and it was moving down the river, which was a concern. So what we want to do is we, we work with Cindy, and, and we also met with mayors last week. We're working to form partnerships with the county, um, with health departments, with, with the municipalities, and, and with the public and, and with Clean Ocean Action and other groups to start addressing what we can do to actually fix some of the water quality problems. Um, we want to look for actions that we can actually maybe start now. I mean, there are things that can be started as we're sampling um, and still looking for, to ID sources. So we always want to look at that positive. What can we do now that we can move forward with? And a lot of things, there's domestic animal waste, there, there is wildlife sources of fecal coliform, geese, um, deer, and it, all those wildlife can be sources. We also have septic system, boat discharges, and there's sewage infrastructure that we have. Many times you have a very small problem somewhere, and it's just a matter of finding out where that is. And what we want to do, though, is develop those plans with the partnerships and that goes within our own department, working with other groups within our water programs, to look for actions that are going to be long-term fixes that can be extrapolated and used in the other water bodies. Because it's likely if we can find something that will work locally, it's going to work in other areas too, which is why when we met with the mayors, it just wasn't with the mayors around in Navasink, it also went out to the Shrewsbury too. And anything we find in this area, it, it, it might work throughout the whole state. Um, and the reason why we're performing this study is 2006, there was a bacterial TMDL put in place on the Navasink River. That's total maximum daily load. It, 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 puts in, it implements different stormwater management practices and to try to fix things and reduce the bacterial load. Um, in 2008, we did a lot of sampling from 2006 to 2008 doing source tracking work. 
there were a lot of areas that were identified as problem areas in, in spots. Um, Monmouth County Health Department at that time actively worked with the municipalities and they, they found a lot of things and fixed a lot of things. But even with all that work, and the reason why we're looking for those more long-term solutions moving forward is based on classification in 2015, we downgraded 565 acres in Navasing. Um, and the main point is the data analysis when we look at this, it's attributed to large spikes in, in bacterial concentrations, primarily after wet weather events. So basically what that is saying is we have a non-point source pollution problem. We're not seeing it on just a routine basis, it's mainly after those, those wet weather events. This orange area right here, this is the area that got downgraded in 2015. So we've had earlier work where downgrades were done in this zone up here, and that's where a lot of the early work focused in, in, in the mid-2000s. This area we had as a restricted classification, but now it's going to prohibited. So there's a clear change for, for a large area and a big chunk of the river. Our, our concern is those yellow areas are seasonal waters. They're conditionally approved. They're open for harvest during the winter time to go to direct market. Those are the only waters in Monmouth County that at that time of the year at, can go to direct to market from harvest. Um, so our concern, that line moving down. So we want to address things now, which is why we implemented and started doing some source tracking work to move forward. This is what we do when we do our classification analysis. We can, we can take rainfall and we can look at the rainfall 24 hours prior to sampling and we look at the fecal coliform counts. And we can come up with a chart and a map that shows us basically where we're seeing the higher levels with, with that 24 hour rainfall impact. So you can see it extends down and right up to that that, that area, uh, the Cleese Creek in that upper portion, and that's where that downgrade area went down to in 2015. What we do is we study design. We, we, we design a study and we select locations and we want to address potential sources of pollution, so we want to look for stormwater outfalls. We want to look for any tributary that's coming in and select sampling stations that we can get to. But we also do the main stem of the river by boat because we want to see how that, that circulates through due to the rain. Um, so, so we have multiple stations in this study. We have 26 stations. Um, we sample dry weather events during tide cycles. We want to know how it moves under dry conditions. So we want to know it, on, on a flooding tide, how does it move? Sample at low tide, sam sample at an hourly interval right up to high tide, and we sample and we analyze all those samples. Um, under wet weather events, we do a pre-storm before the rain starts from all those stations, and we'll do a first flush, and that's when we first start seeing the runoff coming out of the pipes. And then we'll do it at one to two hours past the first flush, because that gives you an idea of how much travel time there is from the source. So it's likely if we see things in the first flush, the source is probably pretty close if it starts to dilute out later. Um, and we analyze both for fecal coliform and enterococcus, Enterococcus is the recreational bathing criteria for marine waters. Fecal coliform is for shellfish classification, so we will look for both of those. Um, and then we will use on, on samples with really high levels of fecal coliform, we will use what we call antibiotic resistance analysis. This takes col representative colonies off the plate that we have of fecal coliform, and we expose them to multiple antibiotics and multiple dilutions. The principle behind it is, Humans being exposed to many antibiotics, a human source, that bacteria is going to be resistant to a lot of antibiotics. Where wildlife exposed to very few antibiotics, you will not see a lot of resistance to it. And domestic animals can fall somewhere in between because all of our animals at some point typically get some kind of antibiotic. So we've done a lot of library searches and tests over the years from wastewater treatment plants from undeveloped, middle of nowhere wildlife areas and also in residential areas where we know there's, there's domestic animals. Sampling the date, we, we did three sampling events. So last time that we were here, we had June 5th, we did a sampling event, it was a half inch of rain. 
We had July 7th where we did a flood tide study and we did it July 18th, which was a rain event. It was a little smaller than the first one, but it was two tenths of, over two tenths of an inch of rain in 15 minutes. So the runoff that was generated was, was pretty strong. So I'm gonna, you, you should be animated. Um, go through them a little quicker, but I'll show you the results on what they look like in the 6-5 event. So we start with all those sampling stations, and you can see how it changes in concentration when those colors get darker. That's where we're seeing the hot spots of where we're seeing fecal coliform coming from. So in this sample, you can see 55 that was up at the top. Um, yeah, 55 that was up at the top, you can see there. That, that was one that was on the north side, and we had very high levels on that first rain event. Um, we did not look at the tide cycle at this point, but we're, this, this was generated with a lot of runoff, and there'll be a little more detail move, moving forward. This was flood tide results. We want to know how it looks like when the tide changes and how water moves around. So you can start this, and you can see where the bacteria levels are, and you can actually see the effect of the incoming tide and how the main body of the river going blue. The water quality is not that bad. So on, on a normal routine basis, you can see the effect of the tide um, on an incoming tide. So, so we, we get an idea of how the water moves if the tide comes in. Uh, but, but it kind of points us to, under dry conditions, there's still a little hot spot area, but we're not looking at a broad scale thing across the whole river. Big chunks of the river are fine. We're seeing very isolated pockets near sources of tributaries or, or alcohols. <clears throat>